Yeah. Okay, we'll make a start. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, we've tried, I'm told I've got to stand here to introduce people, uh, so I don't sound like some disembodied voice coming in from the side. Um, we try and do these because they give us a good opportunity to get a group of different people to come and speak um, and allows us to indulge ourselves getting a good range of things on a particular topic. Um, today we've got one on visual arts with three speakers. Stephanie Luthwaite, University of Nottingham, Ethna Quinn from the University of Manchester, Jennifer Smy from the University of Warwick. Um, I'll introduce them all very briefly and then get out of the way and allow you to listen to their, their presentations. Steph, as you all know, works on um, Latino art and American studies. Uh, her first book, Race, Place and Reform in Mexico and Los Angeles, came out in 2009 in the University of Arizona Press. And she's presently working on another book called, tentatively called, Remaking Modernism. I think, something like that, um, which will be coming out soon when she's finished it. Um, and she's also published articles in the Journal of American Studies and Pacific Historical Review. She also edits, guest edited a special issue of the Journal of American Studies, very fine special issue, I think, on Art Across Frontiers. Um, Ethna Quinn was once in this parish, um, so nice homecoming for you, I think. Um, for, and she works on African American popular culture, US race, politics, and cultural industries. Uh, her first book was called uh, Nothing But a G-Fang, The Culture and Commerce of Gangster Rap. New project is a piece of the action, race and labour in post-civil rights in American cinema, which will be coming out at Columbia University Press soon. Yeah. Okay. Before the next ref cycle. <laughs> yes. um, I also had an article recently in the Journal of American History, uh, which I recommend reading. And finally, Jennifer Smythe from Warwick uh, University, um, who's published several books and articles, uh, and publications, it's, it's really long actually. I was just looking through it trying to pick out the highlights and that's actually quite difficult. Um, but anyway, she's the author of Reconstructing American Historical Cinema from Cinema on Citizen Kane, which came out in 2006 with the University Press of Kentucky. Lots and lots of articles and other books too. And her present project is on um, the work of Fred Zinnemann and Hollywood and historical cinema. So first of all then, we'll start with Stephanie, who's talking about um, contemporary New Mexican art and the politics of the Okay. Right. Okay. Now this paper examines the ways in which contemporary New Mexican artists challenge the colonial myths that continue to shape the status and identity of Spanish-speaking Hispanos. Contemporary female Hispano artists in particular have questioned certain myths about New Mexico's colonial heritage, principally those myths that privilege racial purity and patriarchal authority. By recuperating a colonial past tied to the oppression of indigenous womanhood, Hispanos have created the basis for an alternative mestiza genealogy, and it's one that references patterns of inequality in past and present day New Mexico. Hispano artists have had to contend with several layers of colonial history in New Mexico, Spanish colonialism from the 16th century, and after Mexico was defeated in the Mexican-US War between 1846 and 48, Anglo-American rule. Between 1598 and the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, Spanish colonists subjected New Mexico's native population to forced labor and coercive evangelization. The Spanish reconquest of New Mexico in 1693 also involved a so-called just war against nomadic Indians, which involved the taking of native war captives as slaves. These captives were known as Henizeros, detribalized Indians. Many were women and children who later gave birth to mestizo, mixed Spanish native offspring. And in response to the growth of Henizero and mestizo, mixed populations, Spanish colonists established a caste system of racial classification in which honor and social status were linked to racial purity. Although the caste system acknowledged inter-ethnic unions and mestizaje mixing through the proliferation of what some scholars claim more than 60 racial categories, ultimately it sanctioned blood purity as an organizing principle of colonial society. After the US takeover of the Southwest in 1848, New Mexico's Spanish-speaking Hispanos became second-class citizens who lost land, political power and social status. As anglo migration and railroad building intensified, Hispano communities faced cultural incursion through tourism, the creation of Anglo-artist colonies, and the arrival of preservationists who sponsored the recovery of Hispano culture in the 1920s and 30s. From the early 1900s, 
New myths about racial purity and the Spanish colonial past emerged to meet the needs of white patrons, boosters and tourists. New Mexico was promoted as a tricultural society where Anglos, Hispanos and Pueblo Indians coexisted harmoniously with distinct ethnocultural identities and relationships to the land. In this narrative, Hispanos were relics of a 16th century colonial past. They were direct descendants of the first Spanish colonists, a pure Spanish blood rather than of mixed mestizo ancestry and Spanish American or Hispano rather than of the sort of, at that point, sort of degraded Mexican descent, Mexican being a very derogatory term. Anglo boosters used the Spanish colonial myth to sell New Mexico as a land of enchantment where tourists could still encounter so-called primitive ethnic cultures. Anglo campaigners for New Mexico's incorporation as a US state in 1912 also used the myth to challenge arguments that the numerically important Hispano population was of indigenous and mestizo ancestry, non-white and therefore unfit to govern. Hispano elites also embraced the Spanish purity myth to claim whiteness and citizenship under Anglo rule as their economic, political power diminished. Now the Spanish colonial myth was made tangible in fiestas, in architectural revivals, in cultural tourism and in the development of, in Santa Fe specifically of a market for Spanish colonial art which remains separate to this day from Indian market and that was a, a, a tradition that was established sort of in the, in the early 1920s. However, the Spanish colonial model has served as a trap, argue scholars, by relegating Hispanos and their culture to a pre-modern space bound by tradition and authenticity. But more broadly, the colonial myth has stymied the exploration of New Mexico's history of mestizaje, together with a critique of social inequality in a state that is currently second only to Mississippi in terms of its poverty rate. The Spanish colonial myth has intensified opposition towards the revision of colonial narratives and iconography among Anglos, but also among conservative Hispanos whose race pride has become embedded in perpetuating the colonial myth. And this opposition is apparent in the reaction to contemporary art projects that begin to question the Spanish colonial myth. In 1984, Texas-born sculptor Luis Jimenez created a public fiberglass sculpture for Albuquerque's Old Town entitled Southwest Pieta. The sculpture depicts a pre-Columbian narrative popularized on Mexican lotteria cards and calendars. The Aztec warrior Popocatapetl cradles his dead lover, the princess Ixtaxahuatl, before being reunited in death and transformed by the gods into the volcanoes that circle the valley of Mexico. Conservative Hispano elites criticised Southwest Pieta for desecrating what they thought was a Spanish colonial memory. One critic suggested that the Aztec warrior was really a Spanish conquistador in disguise engaged in the act of killing an Indian princess. Protests led to the sculpture's removal. In 1998, in Alcalde, north of Española, protesters defaced a sculpture of New Mexico's, New Mexico's first Spanish governor, Juan de Oñate, used to mark Oñate's founding of the first Spanish colony in 1598. In 1599, after fierce indigenous opposition to Spanish colonial rule, Oñate ordered the right foot of every man in Acoma Pueblo to be cut off. 400 years later, protesters removed Oñate's right foot from this sculpture. And the act exposed the myth of tricultural harmony and the erasure of Native American historical memory from the Spanish colonial narrative. But it also suggested how art can generate spaces for debating competing colonial narratives and the elision of New Mexico's indigenous heritage within Hispano society. Some of the most incisive critiques of these colonial myths have come from Hispano artists who have connections with Mexican-American and Chicana feminist art traditions coming from outside New Mexico. Chicana artists have done much to expose the multiple race, class and gender-based oppressions stemming from colonialism. In 2001, controversy broke out of the, over the allegedly sacrilegious digital portrait of an indigenized and partially naked Virgin Mary of Guadalupe by Los Angeles-based artist Chicana Alma Lopez. And this was part of a Tradition Meets Technology exhibition at Santa Fe's um, Museum of International Folk Art. 
Lopez's Virgin wears a garland of roses symbolizing the Virgin's appearance to the Indian Juan Diego in 1531 and a stone cloak adorned with a pre-Columbian iconography to signify the presence of Coyol Shwaki, the Aztec warrior goddess, the moon goddess. Lopez reincarnated the Virgin as an emblem of Chicano hybridity and empowerment in the guise of Coyol Shwaki, a figure who represents, according to Chicana feminist writer Sherry Moraga, the rebellious daughter, the feminine force, our attempt to pick up the fragments of our dismembered womanhood and reconstitute ourselves. Lopez's syncretic Guadalupe represented what the artist called the multiplicities of our lived realities. However, protesters within Santa Fe's Catholic community, both Anglo and Hispano, reacted angrily, arguing that Our Lady was a colonial icon of purity and tradition and that the image be removed. In June 2001, Hispana artists leapt to Lopez's defence by organising a follow-up exhibition in Santa Fe, and it was entitled Las Malcriadas, colouring out the lines. And the term Las Malcriadas in Spanish really means sort of badly behaved women and girls, um, or to quote um, Lopez and others, those who do not know their place. Now one of these artists was Delilah Montoya. Montoya had already begun to challenge New Mexico's model of racial politics by revealing patterns of indigeneity, mestizaje, and gender oppression, obscured by the Spanish colonial myth in her work. So she's very much sort of complementing Lopez's revision of colonial Catholic iconography. Born of Anglo and Hispana parentage in Fort Worth, Texas in 1955, Montoya spent much of her early life in Omaha, Nebraska, where she witnessed the struggles of Mexican migrant workers and political activism amongst Chicanos and African Americans. And she later completed her art exhibition, sorry, her art education at the University of New Mexico in her mother's home state. The history and legacy of colonialism remain central concerns for Montoya, whose aim, she says, is to comprehend colonialism as a substructure of our contemporary social footprint. And she's always been interested in photographic portraiture's connection to the colonial gaze and ethnographic spectacle. Evident, for example, in her almost sort of reverse ethnography series, Shooting the Tourist, and in To Be Invisible, from um, uh, Nameless from To Be Invisible. Both of which play on what Jennifer Gonzalez calls economies of visibility and invisibility. And Montoya is also very much sort of trying to get to the this heart of this problem that also as a photographer you're very complicit in the act of looking and how do you, how do you deal with that contradiction. Montoya's New Mexican heritage and her grandfather's membership in the Hispano lay confraternity, the Penitente Brothers, have inspired much of her religious themed work and her exploration of mestizaje. In the Colotype Portrait series, Sagrado Corazon, Sacred Heart, she examines sacred heart symbolism as evidence of the religious hybridity that developed in the colonial Americas. And she connects sacred heart iconography with the Nahua concept of Yolteotl, which means sort of, you know, the heart of God or the sacred spirit of enlightenment. For Montoya, Mestizaje is an important signifier of colonialism, made tangible in the form of the body, which is, as Rafael Perez Torres argues, the physical manifestation of a long, difficult and constantly evolving colonial history. The act of critically restaging the body characterises Montoya's photography, which is unsurprising given the deep connection between colonialism and the display or erasure of the ethnic subject in New Mexico's artistic heritage. By the 18th century, a complex system of caster paintings defined the racial and social status of New Mexico's mestizo in indigenous subjects. Under Anglo rule, Hispano and native cultures were also subject to display in museums and in forms of ethnographic spectacle associated with the photographic work of men such as Charles Fletcher Loomis, who's here documenting the sort of the, um, what was seen at the time as the quite primitive and barbaric rites of the Penitente Brotherhood, and, of course, more familiar, um, Edward Curtis's work, um, um, and we'll, we'll come back to, to looking at some of these images. While caster paintings classified mixed ancestry subjects in inferior racial and social terms, Anglo-visual culture denied evidence of intermixing between Hispanos and native peoples, sometimes even removing the Hispano body completely, as in Ansel Adams' photograph, Penitente Morada, from 1929. Montoya's work challenges these colonial economies of visibility and invisibility in which the mestizo body is either over-determined or erased. 
Now, a number of Montoya's portraits in Sagrado Corazon mimic the Native American types in photographer Edward Curtis's The North American Indian. Montoya presents us with the unnamed Los Jovenes um, youths and La Loca in the next one here, um, Homegirl, as a way of mapping Curtis's colonialist typology onto contemporary stereotypes about Chicanos as urban gang members. Here, however, young sort of aerosol artists from working class Albuquerque barrio signify creativity and collectivity rather than destruction because it's their graffiti artwork that adorns the backdrop of Montoya's installation. Montoya even plays with Curtis's um, pictorialist aesthetic by fusing the 19th century color type process with contemporary muralism and graffiti <coughs> to create a soft focused image. Here she questions the existing archive, not only by blending photographic genres with muralism and graffiti. The series also depicts types that embody the historical comple complexity of subject formation in New Mexico. In La Genizera, the Hispana girl dressed in native costume holds a dream catcher associated with the Plains Indians. She represents the intercultural and statistical reality that almost a third of New Mexico's inhabitants by the late 18th century were Genizeros, detribalized Native Americans, Navajos, Apaches, Comanches, or sometimes Utes, who were brought into Hispano household society and culture and into the Catholic faith through war, trade, and captivity. Most Genizeros were women and children who were captured during wars and slave raids. Others were bought and sold into slavery as a result of Spanish trading networks with Navajos and Comanches. The latter, as historian Pekka Hemelin documents, controlled the most expansive slave economy in the region. Spanish women were also taken captive in war and adopted into Comanche society. From the mid-18th century, Henizeros, who had been granted freedom, were relo relocated to the communities of Belén, Arbecu and Ojo Caliente in order to create a series of buffer communities against further Comanche incursions into the Spanish-Mexican borderlands. But as Hemelin notes, many Henizeros, um, and particularly these communities, retained ties with the Comanche Empire while building new affiliations through trade, marriage and kinship. Their mestizo descendants, claims James Brooks, blurred the boundaries, he says, between New Mexican villages and their Indian neighbours. On the other side, as Curtis Maris has suggested, Captivity and adoption had so dramatically blurred the lines between Comanches and Hispanos by 1848 that incoming Anglo-Americans rescuing Hispanos from Comancheria territory back into white civilization often could not tell the difference between Hispano and Comanche. Hemelin's argument that the overwhelming presence, he says, of Comanches promoted widespread ethnic mixing perhaps suggests why contemporary Hispano artists have looked to Genizero culture as a way of understanding colonialism and mestizaje. Montoya's La Genizero exposes the nomadic Indian mestizaje that lies at the heart of many present-day New Mexican communities, a mestizaje that was suppressed from view in scholarly, literary and artistic records. Curtis would never have, of course, photographed a detribalized Indian whose descendants were only given official status as indigenous peoples in 2007 by the New Mexican government. These forms of ethnographic erasure affected Hispano family and intergenerational memory in New Mexico. Montoya remembers her mother insisting that the family was of pure Spanish origin and not Mexican in particular. Yet she mused, in Mexico, I am a tourist. I have no relatives to visit. The same thing is true when I am in Spain. Am I really Spanish? Montoya's recuperation of La Genizera in the form of a present-day mestiza body mirrors a wider pattern in which, to quote Curtis Maras, modern-day uh, Hispano mestizos raid the Comancheria past for strategies of survival and opposition in the present. Today, working-class uh, mestizo, com mestizo communities perform their native Comanche affiliations through dance, drama and music. The dance drama Los Comanches is performed in the communities of Alcalde and Talpa near Taos. During Christmas and New Year feast days, residents dress in native costume to act out the 1779 defeat of the Comanche chief, Greenhorn, and the eventual Comanche truce with colonial Spain. In its contemporary guise, Los Comanches celebrates not only the eventual truce, but affiliations between Hispanos and Comanches, and also connections with Pueblo communities where Los Comanches is also performed. <laughs> 
Now, these performances have taken place in communities off the beaten track and out of view, if you like, of Santa Fe-based tourists and anthropologists. Only recently have they received scholarly and artistic attention, as in, for example, this um, 2000, and this is where these photographs come from, uh, taken by contemporary Hispano photographer Miguel Gandet, um, a 2000 publication called Nuevo México Profundo, which is very much dedicated, and there's some essays as well there by Enrique La Madrid, to looking at um, New Mexico's Indo-Hispano heritage, and particularly certain um, performances like Los Comanches. La Madrid and Brenda Romero have also recuperated New Mexico's musical ballad tradition, the Indita, literally meaning Little Indian, in relation to the history of native Spanish interaction and Penizero culture. They claim that some Inditas, particularly Inditas that narrated tales of captivity, were written not just about, but also by Christianized Penizeros. And as the ballad moved northwards from Mexico to New Mexico, the standard representation of the native woman as an eroticized figure changed, argues Brenda Romero. The female subject became the focus for what she calls an emerging lament style, a stylistic shift in which the native woman came to represent what she calls a personification and feminization of the land. Thus, for Romero, the indita genre constitutes what she calls a way of coming to terms with our indigenous mother. By exploring Mestizaje through a lost indigenous female subject, Montoya's work functions in a similar way, providing the basis for an alternative Mestiza genealogy. Henizeros were double outsiders, and as Ramon Gutierrez says, dishonored figures. They were marginalized from both Spanish and Pueblo societies because of their enslaved status. Enslaved native women were also raped and physically and sexually abused by their masters. Their illegitimate mestizo offspring were often enslaved too, or orphaned into the Catholic Church. Spanish colonial society then established a preference for young female slaves. Here, hence, you know, we see the young girl in Montoya's image, which generated um, what scholars have called a system, and, and Gutierrez in particular, a system of social and biological reproduction. And it was one based on illegitimacy, social marginalization, and mestizaje. In many ways, then, La Genizera exemplifies Chicana Sheri Moraga's model of dismembered womanhood. And it's Chicana feminist writing that sort of comes into view here, because it often emphasizes the body as a site of oppression and memory through what Norma Alachon calls the recodification of the native woman. As tribal ethnicities, she says, are broken down by conquest and colonizations, Bodies are often multiply racialized and dislocated as if they had no other contents, contents. The effort to recontextualize the process recovers, speaks for, or gives voice to women on the bottom of a historically hierarchical economic and political structure. So Montoya's use of the racialized and exploited female body as a site for unraveling New Mexico's mestizo heritage and its matrilineal basis Montoya is sort of beginning to replicate the Chicana, to quote Allah one again, effort to pluralize the racialized body through the reappropriation of the native woman. Yet she also complicates an established Chicana framework that privileges Mexico's pre-Columbian Aztec past, if we want to think back to Alma Lopez's um, image. Montoya instead excavates the long history of New Mexico's nomadic Indian Spanish interaction, tracing a mestiza genealogy based on the specificities of regional and colonial history. Now, it's interesting that Montoya's series emerged at the same time as Chicana feminist Ana Castillo's 1993 novel, which was based in New Mexico called So Far From God. And in this, Castillo tells the narrative of a family of outcasts, a single mother and her four daughters, who employ local indigenous healing practices and forms of hybrid spirituality to um, contest social and patriarchal oppression. But Montoya also references the distinctiveness of Chicano activism in New Mexico in the 60s and 70s. The mark making on the wall behind La Genizera, the graffiti which states, como mis canales, so Spanish for as or like my brothers, is multivalent. It references Texan-born but New Mexican-based activist Reyes Lopez Tijerina, whose federal alliance of land grants demanded the return of land and property rights appropriated by the US in 1848. And he also wanted to push this idea very much that Hispanos should begin to recover their indigenous heritage. 
because it was, um, for example, Tehrina also said, we are the people the Indians call their lost brothers. Montoya's mural and graffiti art forms also reference native culture by resembling petroglyphs, rock art and pictographs found in New Mexico and across Comancheria territory. Petroglyphs were not just prehistoric, they were also created by Comanches during the 18th century as a result of frontier conflict and they often mimicked hand gestures used in Comanche warrior society and you can sort of see again if you look some more closely at the bottom on the right hand side here Montoya's image the sort of placement of, of, of hands um, and you get that very much in the image here um, which was supposedly done um, by um, Comanches in the 18th century. Now Montoya's female subject however works to feminise masculinist forms of Comanche warrior art, Chicano activism that was led by men like Tijerina and Barrio Carnalismo brotherhood. Perhaps the mark maker we might ask is actually La Genizera, or Montoya herself, seeking incorporation, like her brothers, into an Indo-Hispano lineage that reminds us of the matrilineal basis for Mestizaje. Now, Montoya's excavation of the Indian mother becomes not just about the lost origin of a Mestizo people, a romanticised lament, if you like, but an important foundation for critique and activism. The references to canalismo, brotherhood, point towards the possibility of future collective action. Montoya's mixed iconographies and genres also blur notions of time and bring La Genizera into the present. Recent scholarship by James Brooks also suggests that Genizera women were embedded in what he calls a deeply ambivalent dialectic between exploitation and negotiation and that they exerted more agency than was previously assumed through patterns of kinship, labour and diplomacy. In Montoya's case, La Genizera also becomes not just an object or a commodity, but an, an agent and the foundation for a lineage of malcriadas, women who do not know their own place, developed in subsequent photographic film and installation work. And here we've got, this includes, for example, um, her 2002 um, video installation, some images from this Doña Sebastiana, who's New Mexico's skeletal folk heroine or angel of death, and of course, in 2006, her, her um, series called um, New Warriors, and it's about um, um, professional women boxers um, in New Mexico. Montoya's current project ties colonial forms of racial classification to present-day social inequalities. In contemporary caster paintings, Montoya replaced the 18th century colonial aesthetic using portraits of contemporary Hispano families in Santa Fe. Whilst exposing the complexity of family structure and ancestry, she reminds us that colonial notions of blood purity still determine social status in New Mexico. Montoya's images from Sagrado Corazon prefigure her contemporary caster paintings, specifically on the left here, La Familia. La Genizera also mimics an earlier caster tradition as much as it imitates Curtis's iconography. Only here, of course, if we move back, the subject is without the family unit that appears in most caster paintings. Montoya's experimentation then with caster paintings draws us back to the multiple racialized class and gendered associations of the term caste in both Spanish and US colonial context. Caste, of course, deriving from the Latin word for chaste. In La Genizera, however, the politicized graffiti promises to relocate the outcast and the so-called unchaste body to some form of future collectivity. That may be, for example, the Mestizo family that we see in Montoya's contemporary cast of painting, which is also sort of very much played upon her images of, of, of women boxes in New Mexico, and very much this idea where the woman stands very defi defiantly centre stage. So just to conclude here, John Noriega states that in Chicano photography, he says, narrative provides a way of subordinating styles and idioms to a new photographic language able to tell a particular story located at the crossroads of conflicting historical perspectives, what he calls histories in relation. These histories in relation appear most powerfully in La Genizera, a work that challenges the racial, elitist and patriarchal thinking at the core of the Spanish colonial myth. As Constance Cortez writes, she says to be Chicano, and Chicana is to be informed by many colonial pasts that suggest multiple readings of the present. By recuperating the fragments of a dismembered womanhood, disidentifying with Spanishness, to quote Curtis Maras, 
Montoya also reads colonialism differently and multiply. And she exposes a mestizo of genealogy that confronts past and present race, race class, and gender-based hierarchies. Montoya remains an outsider, a malcriada herself in many respects, someone who is often associated with Chicana art traditions coming out of a non-New Mexican context. I suggest that her work also be viewed as that of an insider and as a serious contribution to the very belated process of decolonizing and demythologizing Hispano New Mexico. Okay. I'm a bit worried I might have run out of time. Subordinating narrative in another key now. There we are. I'm going to be very bad because I have a tendency to move around, so your video might not come out so well. Thanks, Stephanie, for inviting me. Um, I work primarily in the studio archives. Are there any film historians out there who do the same? I see a show of hands. You're mostly art historians? Well, now you can see how the other half lives. Um, I've always felt uncomfortable to a certain extent with the degree of interpretive guesswork that's involved in close analysis and the principles of auteur and genre theory, but then I'm also uncomfortable with the amount of interpretive guesswork involved in actually writing a book of history. Um, I'm relativist enough to believe that written history and visual history are both imaginative adaptations and editings of the past, but old-fashioned historian enough to believe that a film's meaning can be contextually triangulated to the intents of its producers, but it is a partial meaning, of course. Archives, of course, are even more partial in the kinds of histories that they enable arch archival historians to follow, and Hollywood uh, historians are notoriously bereft in certain areas, but I've been very fortunate for the past nine years I've been working with the papers of this man, director Fred Zinneman, who, a director who repeatedly dismissed the criteria for Americanized auteurism pioneered by Andrew Saris. He flouted generic conventions repeatedly throughout his career, and he spent most of his time making historical films about war, resistance and nationalism that really refuse easy solutions and don't really fit within the typical classical Hollywood model that we've tended to imbibe from the likes of David Bordwell. But very happily, he kept almost everything from his Hollywood career. He was a pack rat and kept everything from post-it notes to pieces of toilet paper that he wrote, uh, you know, ideas for films on. The toilet papers in the British Film Institute for some reason and the post-it notes are over in Los Angeles. So I've had a, a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to show some treasures from the archives. It's going to appear like greatest hits for a minute. Um, this is actually a page from his research notebooks from 1948. Um, he was the first Hollywood filmmaker who was allowed inside occupied Germany after the First World War. So before um, the hordes started to descend, uh, Billy Wyler had been invited by the army to do some editing for the death mills, but Zinnemann actually was over in Germany and in Czechoslovakia um, in 1946-47 and spent upwards of two years there collecting um, images and oral testimony from <coughs> child Holocaust survivors, um, people who had been in the camps in Ravensbrück and also Auschwitz primarily. And he visited all the major children's homes that were run by UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Recovery Administration, and later taken over by the IRO. Um, and he also hired these children to appear in his film, The Search. So although there are a few professional actors, and this is one of Montgomery Cliff's first films, people didn't believe he was an actor. They thought he was a, a soldier who had been hired for the part. He was so good. But the children are really the feature. And you have Ivan Yandel, who was a Czech radio actor who had lived through the occupation of Czechoslovakia. He's about the only one who had any kind of professional context. The rest of them um, basically gave their stories to Zinnemann over a period of, of weeks and sometimes months. And then portions of their oral histories were then integrated into the narrative, a script that he rewrote with Richard Schweitzer, um, and then they appeared as themselves to a certain extent, and this is one of his images from the Warsaw Ghetto, and I was looking through additional notebooks which haven't been donated to the Academy, which still belong to the family, and I found this image here, and if anybody has ever seen the search, you'll recognize this motif of the chain link fence again and again, and it has a context that's wartime but also post-war, and that the child who is looking for his mother um, 
is also at one point almost adopted and brought to America and there are all kinds of immigration restrictions which are thrown in his way. Of course, it's America and it's still, the Johnston Reed Act is still in effect and we all know some of the consequences of that. But there's an image in which he's saying goodbye to his mother at Auschwitz and the kiss um, was actually replayed again. So it's something that he restaged. And here he is with um, an, another piece from his archive. Uh, he was nearly fired. He was actually fired from MGM for making this film and staying away too long. Um, but he didn't really care to a certain extent. He had lost most of his family members. And it was enormously important for him to, to spend a couple of years working with a Swiss production company on this film. And when he came back, um, all was forgotten. It was one of the first major European films to um, do better overseas than in Hollywood. And MGM wanted to keep him, but they lost him. And he ended up making <coughs> uh, some films with another independent production company, Stanley Kramer. And you'll all recognize Gary Cooper from High Noon. And High Noon actually figures in my study of um, Zinnemann's films of war and resistance for a number of reasons. Zinnemann was criticized heavily for making this film. Um, at one point after the initial cut was shown to producers, um, many people were sort of outraged at the, the number of the litany of um, omissions and, and uh, conventions that he had flouted in this Ameri most American of genres. And one of the producers said very appropriately, if you think so. Uh, what does a Jewish filmmaker know about making Westerns? Anyway, he was one of the very few filmmakers in Hollywood who was not native-born American. He was Jewish, and he dared to make a Western, and a number of people in Hollywood and outside drew attention to this. And many critics, um, whether or not they shared a version of this nativism and anti-Semitism the, from the 1960s onwards, tended to view this Western as an anomaly. Um, or more Carl, Carl Foreman's film, this famous screenwriter who was exiled and fled to Britain um, after he was called before HUAC. Um, and it's tended to seem an anomaly within the Hollywood auteur tradition. You focus on the screenwriter rather than the director, and so therefore the director has to be some aberrant element in it. But I became interested in High Noon because um, in reading through Zinnemann's papers, I actually found that he was very heavily influenced by Sergei Eisenstein. And in fact, one of the first Western films that he almost became involved in um, was in the early 30s when he was working for Robert Flaherty. And the two of them wanted to do a Western-type film, but in Russia, and to look at a, an early nomadic trial. Um, that had been modernized by the new government and of course it didn't get made because they were terrified about what Flaherty would do when he got inside of Russia but he got, but Zinnemann got to meet Podovkin and he got to meet Eisenstein and when he was working through the editing of this film and shooting it he camera cut because he knew that he might not have complete control over the final cut he wanted to have close-ups, as many close-ups as possible. And for those of you that are familiar with the genre, I mean, if you go back to, you know, the work of Marshall Landy or Edward Buscom, any number of, of film historians, and, and even back to Frederick Jackson Turner himself, the idea of the Western is the man on the horse, you know, it's the long shot. He completely inverts it here. But not only that, um, the film company and Zinnemann himself, in collaboration with Gary Cooper, and there are a number of sort of editing notes and communications between the two of them that Zinnemann saved, um, Cooper was, of course, very, he was older at this point. He was not the gorgeous Virginian he had been in the 19, uh, 19, 1929 when he played in the first sound version of that iconic text. Um, but the cinematographer Floyd Crosby and Zinnemann decided they wanted to have a different approach to this film, and they deliberately went for burnt out lighting and for, you know, no filters. They wanted to have it look as harsh as possible, no pretty pictures, no clouds. And above all, if you get close to Gary Cooper's face, you see his sweat and you see his age and you see his pain. And for those of you that haven't seen <coughs> this film, you also see him cry. And seeing this in the context of a lot of the Cold War discussion about the Cold Warrior, the idea of the impenetrable boundaries of the Cold Warrior's body, this idea of John Wayne being that kind of icon where you don't cry, you don't sweat, that these are things, these, um, Flu the, fluid the fluidity, for example, is something that is suspect, and this is tied in very much to kinds of discourses from Kennan onwards in terms of Cold War ideology. And I put this together, and I was thinking, oh, come on, isn't this just another one of these ridiculous film studies frameworks that you attach to a film? But actually, it was coded into some of the advertising as well, which is kind of an anomaly um, within the production, and indeed, the filmmakers themselves were very well aware that they wanted this man to sweat, that they wanted certain scenes to emphasize 
emphasize his pain, his age, and the fact that he did break many, many boundaries. And uh, a lot of people in Paramount and more widely in the Hollywood community um, were really upset by what Zinnemann did, but perhaps most of all is the sketch, and this survives in his collection. He, he kept it. Um, of the, some of you may know where I'm going with this, it's the static railroad track image that you get repeatedly again and again throughout the film. And Zinnemann was interesting because he kept a, a newspaper clipping uh, from an interview he had with Otis Ferguson, I believe, where he's actually drawing on the tablecloth and chastens or something. And he said, this is the image I got most excited about when I was making this film. This is what everybody else started to get interested in. When they saw this, there was a kind of excitement. And I wondered basically what that had to do with um, the Western discourse. And was this another way in which you know, this German, oh, well, actually he was Polish outsider. He wasn't actually born in Vienna. He, he lied about it. He was a Polish Jew. Um, <coughs> what he had to say about the West. He said repeatedly that this Western story could have been told anywhere, that American exceptionalism was just a kind of hubris, but also showing that image of progress and movement, static and menacing, and as a harbinger of death, had other connections for him. And this image was in the archive too. And some of you may recognize it for anybody who's lived after 1945. And of course it had connections with the search and his long-standing interest in making more and more films about the Second World War and its memory. Um, you know, there are other sort of treasures that he kept, and um, these are just some of the other editing notes. Often we sort of wonder, how can we justify interpreting a certain sequence in a film in this manner? Zinnemann was great because he kept all of his editing notes, and there are hundreds and hundreds of pages of these things. So I tended to be guided a lot by what he had to say. And here you have Walter Murch's very precise editing comments typed and Zinnemann's edited corrections, and very often he will disagree, no, 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 and underline. And uh, if anybody in the audience has ever dealt with Walter Murch, you'll know how difficult that is to actually say no to him or disagree with him, but Zinnemann was sort of had an iron will. And in terms of how filmmakers actually set up and decide sor sorts of things, when I was looking at his body of work, I was guided by how much material he actually decided to keep on certain films. So maybe I am being manipulated by this filmmaker. Maybe he knew that there would be some patsy out there ready to sort of look at his work in this way. But he would focus very much on this sequence in Julia from 1977, which I've written about before. Um, and another sequence in which he was going through the editing of Julia's death, where it's shot in juxtaposition with a Moscow performance of Hamlet that Jane Fonda's character Lillian Hellman is attending and she falls asleep. And this is so sort of some cross-cutting where you have the staging of a death, the death of Julia and the staging of Hamlet as well too. And you have a lot of over-determined images through colonnades which are used again and again in cinema's work in this film. And of course at the back of his mind, something that I found out in going through his archives, was the fact that he knew that Hellman had been lying about her relationship with Julia, that although Julia was a composite of several women who had worked in the resistance in, in the 1930s, the anti-Nazi resistance, um, she had no relationship with this woman, the close friendship that you see in the film is staged. But he is able to get around that in very interesting ways. And I'm not going to focus on that for this talk, though, because I've done that before, and it's a bit dull, and it's going to bore you. So instead, I'm going to look at the nun story. I don't know how many of you have seen that. Probably anybody seen this film? Yes, there's one or two people. That's fantastic. Audrey Hepburn's favorite film that she ever made, and I'm going to maybe give you some background to sort of understand why. Um, it's a fictionalized biography of an UNRWA nurse, Mary Louise Habits, who the author of the nun story, the original author, um, Catherine Hill, met while doing relief work for displaced peoples in Europe after the Second World War. So they worked for the IRO. They worked at Wildflecken, which was a, a center um, for displaced people in Germany. And Zinnemann, you know, knew home. He knew habits. And actually, it was ironically Gary Cooper who said, this is going to make a great film. I've read this. Will you see if you, what you can do with it? And Cooper was a very shrewd judge of the system because he knew how much Hollywood had relied upon women's fiction and women's history in staging some very powerful narratives. And some people have argued that the major reading and viewing audiences in the 19th and 20th century were predominantly female, and that some of the producers really had caught on to this. Um, now, Habits was an interesting figure because she left the church, and she left it for a particular reason. Um, the Catholic Church's 
notorious um, neutrality with regards to fascism and the Nazi occupation of Europe. She leaves when um, Belgium, her home country, is occupied by the Nazis and she doesn't return. And this raised a lot of problems with the Catholic Church and with censors, even in 1959. Um, they had wanted to edit a lot of this old history and Zinnemann, after what he had learned in 1947-48, was ready to go after them from another angle. And Hepburn, as well, too, had lived through the occupation of Holland. Her, it was a very autobiographical film for her. Her, one of her relatives had been shot by the Nazis, another had been sent to a concentration camp. She was, of course, very embarrassed by her father's um, Mosleyism um, and had lived through that as well, too, and wanted to a certain extent make amends. And she had to choose between making this film and making the diary of Anne Frank. And she chose this film, and I'm glad that she did. And one of the interesting things about this is Zinnemann's annotated shooting script. Um, he goes all the way through it and tries to emphasize a lot of the um, evidence of neutrality on the part of the church, that the church is not supposed to show any kind of um, partiality towards Belgian resistors, is not supposed to treat and the enemy any differently, and Zinnemann was all for blocking in particular shots of Hepburn looking absolutely enraged when she's hearing these sorts of things. There was a statement from May 28, 1940, which um, was indicative of the, well, the Catholic Church's complicity with Hitler. He wanted this in there, even though the censors wanted it out at all costs. Um, now Zinnemann, it, one of the more interesting things about him is that he kept um, a list of all the films he wanted to screen while he was watching, uh, when he was making um, this particular one. He watched Bresson's Manscaped, but he also watched another one called The Passion of Joan of Arc, and I have the document to prove it if you don't believe me. Um, and why that's interesting, I'll, I'll explain. There are lots of cloisters, and there is a certain sequence in which this close-up, lingering close-up appears. And of course, in Gabrielle Vandermaal, this is what she's renamed when she's in the, um, the script. When she leaves, the, uh, when she first enters into the convent, she accepts a number. It replaces her name, 1072, and this is it. When she enters the mother house, this eliminates her identity to a certain extent. She's not going to be Sister Luke until several months later. It's 1927, but there are certain processing elements that the church and Nazi Germany tend to favor, and Zinnemann wrote about these things in the marginalia. Gabrielle also has to beg for food at certain um, sequences. When she's late for meals, she has to do this. She's not allowed to speak. She's not allowed to look at people. Um, she's reprimanded. At one point um, in the script, in the original script with Robert Anderson, they go around collecting bits of gold um, belonging to the postulants. They have to give up all of their worldly possessions as they enter the mother house. And believe me, the church wanted this out because it had repercussions very much with the way that the Jewish and other resistors who were entering into the concentration camps had to be basically stripped of everything, passports, teeth, anything. Um, and they wanted it out. And they did actually get that out. It was shot. It was shot, but then cut by Warner. Um, <clears throat> but one of the more interesting things, I was guided very much by what the filmmakers thought was important. And one of the more interesting things um, was the hair cutting sequence. There was a lot of interest on the part of uh, Robert Anderson and Zinnemann and Hepburn in this sequence. And actually her hairdresser, Grazia de Rossi, plays a role in this film. She's the one who cuts Hepburn's hair. There were no photographers that were allowed on the set for this sequence, even though they were all over the place trying to get after, get any kind of image they could of her. And it was a key scene in the film. And I mean, you can read this bottom paragraph. This is um, Robert Anderson writing to Catherine Holm and Lou Habits, who lived together um, in California. Um, what, what happens? Is it done in the laundry since they've been wearing veils over their ponytails up to this point? What are they given to put on their heads immediately after the clipping? Are they given the little drawstring cap? And on and on and on. And it's, there's a moment in the film that Anderson blocks in that, um, that was very important to Zinnemann too, and he highlighted and underscored when Gabrielle's sister is saying goodbye to her for the last time. Um, she touches her hair and then begins to cry and leaves and can't deal with this. There's this awareness of that coming very early on. And Habits, when 
Um, she was discussing this with Holm, and Holm highlights it to a certain extent that Gabrielle doesn't really care about it, but the scene itself is enormously terrifying in the way that the sisters are hacking away at the hair. Some of the nuns, the, the young nuns, are crying. Others are, you know, basically terrified. Some are laughing, shrieking almost hysterically at what's going on. Gabrielle is very passive and looks down. Um, and it's a, it's a frightening sequence. And Franz Voxman, who was extremely anti-Catholic, scored the film and wanted to have a lot of really terrifying music going on when this was happening. Cinnamon, to a certain extent, trying to soft pedal that, but there were a lot of disagreements between the composer and the director, and I suppose we can talk about that at certain points, but of course there's this. We all can, I mean, but it's this, you know, what justifies my saying there is a connection between this and this, and this martyred woman who was immolated, and this, image and the context line behind this film which is Gabrielle and Sister Luke and L Lou Habits's own resistance to the Catholic passivity during the occupation of Europe. This Ravensburg is what's lying behind a lot of these images but what you know leads me to actually make this kind of argument. Well this is what this is one of those things you find in the archive. This is what Mr. Zinnemann wants to watch when he's you know and he screened this here we are. These two films, Les Anges de Pêche and um, Saint Joan. So this is one of his favorite films. He says it repeatedly throughout his career. He gives a lot of interviews that basically replay different um, key films in his, um, you know, decision to become a filmmaker. But this one had a particular resonance for him, and he and Hepburn watched it together several times. And in fact, Zinnemann actually edits this hair cutting sequence exactly like Dreyer in terms of the off-center close-up followed by another off-center close-up. And Zinnemann didn't like establishing shots where you had big spaces where you knew where you are. He liked to cut from close-up to close up to close up and it's it's pretty evocative um, and there are these other there's a happy image we're not that quite there yet you've got a, a couple more minutes um, but there there was a lot of discussion also about how Hepburn should look there was a lot of emphasis on shooting her looking as ill as possible now she went she went through malaria and dysentery and all sorts of other things so a lot of it wasn't simulated she went through a great deal when she was on location in the Congo but for Zinnemann he wanted the cinematography to reflect her age and her illness and her growing feelings of isolation. So she becomes even thinner if that's possible. But there are lots of documents about just how he wanted her to look and to reflect this kind of, um, this kind of illness, but almost concentration camp-like physique. He wanted that emphasized to a certain extent. And um, later, and this is just an, this is another intertextual connection which I can't really substantiate, but for those of you who've seen Julie Pontecorvo's um, Capo, um, Susan Strasberg, who looks very much like Hepburn, She's a Jewish uh, internee at a camp. The only way she survives is by a sympathetic doctor disguising her as a prisoner, um, a non-Jewish pr prisoner, and he cuts her hair. And the framing of the close-up is exactly the same as these two films. And he did actually see it, but there's no sort of correspondence between these two filmmakers. I try to be precise, but I'm a little hesitant about that. But I, I just wanted to notice as well, too, that contemporary viewers, even though this part of the film where Hepburn is kind of re is resisting the church and there is this implication that um, the church is complicit with the Nazis and that she is going to become a resistor, only one-fifth of the film, it's a long film, it should have been longer, but they cut quite a bit of it, one-fifth of the film, and yet the reviewers focused on this sequence, almost to the exclusion of the others, even though it had showed some of the most beautiful color footage of Africa, the best footage you had seen since Jack Cardiff shot uh, the African Queen several years before. But this is what people wanted to, to listen to, to, to think about. And just to conclude, in, in 57 to 59, when she's making this film with um, Zinnemann, a uh, few actors could match her star power at this time. And Roland Barthes, of course, very famously writes about Hepburn where he says that she's all face in comparison to Garbo. And he makes some very famous comparison between Garbo's timeless mythic classical beauty and Hepburn's beauty, which is m marked by time and by context. Um, but it was marked by her own violent experiences during the war. And the fact is she was very much marked by the past. And we tend to focus on her 
as an icon of youth, and yet this is the film that repeatedly she said was the most important to her, that meant the most in her career, and she and Cinnamon had a very collaborative relationship in which she was able to bring not only Falconetti's performance in Joan of Arc to bear, but also Francois Leterrier, <coughs> who um, worked in Bresson's very famous film, A Man Escape. These were the two models she had for this, this um, figure of Sister Luke. And I'll just say, in passing, Zinnemann kept everything, so in a way this has been very easy for me as well as pleasurable. And you don't often get this close to a filmmaker's mind, the details of reasoning behind a point of view shot, behind cinematography, behind the decision to make a voiceover. But several things emerged in my study that the research process behind any Hollywood film at this period was absolutely staggering, and we do underestimate this. Cinnamon worked collaboratively, so he did abuse the auteur definition to a certain extent, and he was a bit of a martinet, but he did listen to other people, and he listened to, to Hepburn quite a lot. But he was most interested in the complexities of resistance history, its intertextuality, and especially the marginalized role of women during the war, and the way they were edited from histories afterwards. So more than Howard Hawks or John Ford, or Hitchcock, he understood and respected women's resistant historical voice, and I think perhaps that's why he's been so ignored by conventional histories of Hollywood, which tend to characterize Hollywood cinema as a conservative bastion of masculine history and ideology. So, thank you. Right. Where am I? Here. Okay. Um, so, um, my contribution to the round table, um, which includes a clip four minute clip and which I'll keep to 20 minutes because I know it's a long evening um, uh, is uh, focuses on the film In the Heat of the Night um, directed by Norman Jewison released in 1967 I use this film to explore the ways in which liberal Hollywood engaged racial politics at a particularly important moment a time of intense struggle over the integration of America's workplaces and intense struggle over the meaning of racial equality following the Civil Rights Act of 64, the law that banned job discrimination, at least formally, um, a law which is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary next year. In the Heat of the Night was a socially important film. It was seen by the industry and mainstream press to be an ambitious statement about race and was widely acclaimed and much watched and liked by blacks and whites, um, though it also had some prominent black detractors. Uh, perhaps most notably James Baldwin. It all but cleaned up at the Oscars. It won Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Editor, Best Screenplay, Best Sound. As such, um, it is a key case study here. Um, I'm basing the kind of premise of the paper then is that this is a significant film in shaping racial perceptions and its time of release. Who's seen it here? Who's seen it in the heat of the night? About half of you. Okay, so um, it's a film about black detective Virgil Tibbs, played by Sidney Poitier, um, arrested as a suspect in a murder case after visiting his mother in the Deep South um, in Mississippi. Uh, Tibbs end up, ends up helping the racist town of Sparta in Mississippi to solve its murder case. So that's, that's the storyline. Um, quite a bit has been written about In the Heat of the Night by scholars since, um, who share the view that it's a significant text, and this scholarship can be organised into two main strands. Uh, first, work that looks at Poitiers' screen image in this period, which was seen as increasingly out of step with its time. He was seen as civil rights identified at a time of increasing black militancy. Um, most of the people watched this film in 68. Um, they also watched Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which is another key film of 68 um, in which Poitiers starred. Uh, and I'm thinking of scholarly work here by Ed Guerrero, Mark Reed, Jared Sexton, but those kinds of debates have been quite widely rehearsed. <coughs> and the second area of scholarship on the film, um, the film's representation, is of uh, its, its depiction of a white racist South, a backwards Gothic South, um, and there's a representative piece in American literature on this by Andrea Levine. But what I'm suggesting 
is that first the film tells us more about attitudes of white men than it does about constructions of black masculinity. And second, that the film tells us more about racial attitudes in the American North and West, particularly in the film industry, than it does about racial attitudes in the Deep South. Um, this presentation starts with, with my clip, and then I want to briefly make two points about the racial politics of the film that are captured in the clip. Um, though this film was heavily marketed as an ambitious problem picture about race, um, and it's a film I like, actually, and we can come back to that later, um, but... Uh, what I, wanted, what I want to suggest is in contrast to the idea of it being an ambitious problem picture about race, um, I want to argue that the film proposes first that America, um, apart from outside the kind of um, benighted deep south, is post-racial. Um, and second, looking at the production relations of the film, I want to argue that the film projects a sense that Hollywood is post-racial. So that's the second point I want to come to. And I want to end the presentation by opening out uh, for a moment to show how this case study captures the approach that I'm taking in my broader book. Um, and the headline there is that I'm giving, in the book, I'm giving equal weight to um, production relations and textual relations, which might seem quite simplistic. Um, but I'm also trying to think about the intersections between production relations and textual relations. Um, and, and I want to come back to that at the end. Okay. So In the Heat of the Night was made during the winter of 66 and released... Um, in 67. Um, let's look at this iconic, an iconic scene from the film, the early one where the two main antagonists of the film, Virgil Tibbs, Sidney Poitier, and Chief Gillespie, Rod Steiger, who won the Oscar for Best Actor, first meet following Tibbs' arrest. So if, I'm, if I can manage to get this up, um, it should be here. Could you get the lights for me? Would that be okay? Have we got some sound, hopefully? Have we got sound? We had before, yeah. We checked. Yeah, I Should we go back and then just see if we can... Yeah, if you want to check, it should be. It was working before. Help me, yeah. Mm. Should we just go back and try again? Okay. Just bear with us a second. We should get there. Ah. Oh. Tuesdays only, four or five to Memphis. You say? 
You follow me? Yes. Why don't you tell me how you killed Mr. Cobra? And I promise you, you're going to feel a whole lot better. Not now! Love that thing. <laughs> okay, so um, it's an expositional scene staging white southern dysfunction and the shock revelation about the identity of Tibbs. Um, the scene holds great pleasures for viewers. Gillespie is gobsmacked to discover that what Tibbs does for a living. But the viewer isn't so surprised. The viewer is basically in on it because Poitier's immaculate screen presence uh, is set against the, the redneck, undermodernized southern backdrop. So um, from there, then, I want to just look at these two propositions. And the first one um, is that uh, America is post-racial. It's probably that the, the, the film forwards the idea that America is post-racial. Um, I posit that the way this scene projects a sense of the North, represented by Philadelphia, is more significant racially than its direct hyperbolic representation of the South, and, and specifically here the backward police station. The scene suggests that workplaces in, in an enlightened North are already well integrated by 1967, with blacks getting hired and promoted without facing individual and institutional discrimination. Tibbs is Philadelphia's number one homicide detective, um, for which work he's very well paid. This idea that the North has basically moved beyond racial hierarchies, <coughs> post-racial, is further substantiated by the only other Northern character in the film, the widow of the murdered industrialist, played by Lee Grant. She comes off as totally free of racism. She insists that Tibbs is kept on in the murder case and stands with him and with the viewer to ask the retrograde south town of Sparta. She says, my God, what kind of people are you? What kind of place is this? This film, lauded by many as a bold statement on <coughs> race, showed that continuing racism was confined to a backward old South at the exact moment when Martin Luther King had taken his campaign north to highlight conditions in urban neighborhoods and when he and others were starting to ask uncomfortable questions about white racial privilege beyond the South. And at the moment that the Kerner Commission was preparing its report on the urban riots of the mid-1960s, a report which would find that the lack of meaningful job prospects was a major motivating factor for the riots. Now, other scholars have pointed out that In the Heat of the Night romanticizes race relations in the North, um, though I haven't come across any that uh, offer elaboration or specificity in that area. Um, 
But Vera and Gordon do, um, they make this point, but nonetheless they defend the filmmakers, arguing that In the Heat of the Night represents the best that Hollywood film could do in 1967 in the treatment of race relations. It was made by a group of earnest white activists. They had the best pedagogical intentions. Jewison wanted the film to make a difference at the time. Vera and Gordon's is a teleological statement. Uh, They posit that this is the best that can be achieved by whites at that stage on the road toward racial progress. I would argue, in contrast, that the film in many ways is part of what race sociologists have called the liberal retreat from race. That's Steven Steinberg's phrase, which he he dates as starting precisely in the mid-1960s following the civil rights legislative victories. Um, Concurring with Steinberg, Howard Wynant writes in his influential book, The World is a Ghetto, the unity of the civil rights movement eroded rapidly after the mid-1960s. Its mainstream liberal supporters and most of its white adherents congratulated themselves on the victory of the enactment of civil rights reforms. Norman Jewison, I would argue, was one such liberal supporter of the movement who congratulated himself on the legislative victories as a culmination of the struggle. And In the Heat of the Night is, by and large... I'm arguing, an ode to such white liberalism and racial retreat. This was a moment when the terms of racial equality were being vigorously contested. Some favoured a laissez-faire, colour-blind approach to racial amelioration, benign neglect, as it would come to be called, the retreat from race by liberals and conservatives, while others were calling for the need for interventionist, colour-conscious strategies, affirmative action and racially preferential policies, seeing the Civil Rights Act as only the beginning of the next phase of the fight. This is something that not only race sociologists like Steinberg and Wynant have mapped, but also historians like Nancy Fraser in Freedom is Not Enough and others. So the narrative themes of In the Heat of the Night are in many ways, I would say, demobilizing. They breed less affairism amongst centrists, centrist if well-intentioned whites, who can define their own enlightened racial selves in diametric opposition to southern white racists, just at the moment that the freedom struggle, whether of King or SNCC or federal activism, was pointing to the endemic nature of race privilege and institutional discrimination across America that demanded a structural response. Now, my line here might seem a bit trenchant, um, and this is a well-loved film, um, and there are some... We can complicate this reading... But I, think it, but I think this line, this trenchant line, is further supported by looking at race politics in the Hollywood industry at this moment. And this brings me to the second untoward notion that I think this film supports, the idea that Hollywood is post-racial. How does the notion of Tibbs as a top-paid professional sit with racial employment relations in Hollywood in 66-67? What are the film business as a workplace? Well, despite the Civil Rights Act, the industry remained notoriously white and male. There had yet to be a single black director of a studio film, ever, and the industry was dragging its feet in response to calls for integration. The employment, the, sorry, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, when it conducted hearings in Hollywood in the late 60s, found gross underutilization of minority workers and recruiting systems that have as their foreseeable effect the employment only of whites which are completely accepted by industry and by unions. Um, This is something I've explored elsewhere. This complete acceptance of white opportunity hoarding chimes with the production of In the Heat of the Night. There were no black workers behind the scenes. There were some black music stars brought in for the soundtrack. Lucy Jones wrote the score, and Jones uh, got Ray Charles to sing the famous title song. Black performers and producers had some footing in the music industry. But in terms of filmmaking, there was no sense uh, on the part of Jewison or the film's producer, Walter Mirisch, that they had a responsibility to try to diversify the production team below the line. Even though workplace integration is a major theme in the film, the White South painfully coming to terms with the idea of an African-American being top professional, as we saw, there is no equivalent impetus in the film's behind-the-scene workplace. So this is a case of textual relations standing in disjunction with production relations. The film showed that the North had already confronted and overcome its employment exclusions when, in fact, Hollywood had yet to begin its own racial integration. And the first big showdown would come in 69 when the EEOC committee went to Hollywood when the condition, conditions they discovered were so venal, in the words of the EEOC chair, Clifford Alexander, that they brought in the Justice Department who tried to file a suit against the whole industry. 
So even compared to comparable industries, the film industry is seen as, as particularly recalcitrant. Now, from the research I've done, I found that Jewison had no perception of this disjunction between textual and employment relations. Quite the opposite. He repeatedly used this film in publicity statements as a badge of his anti-racist credentials, facing difficult questions about the lack of black creative input on his next film project, The Confessions of Nat Turner. Um, Jewison would assert, I think in the heat of the night speaks for itself as far as my feeling towards social problems in this country. Now, we might argue that Poitier himself represents important integration on this film project, which Jewison helped to bring about. And I think that this offers an important qualifier to my critique, uh, and I have much more material on that. Through this film um, and other Poitier films of the late 60s, he became the first ever A-list black film star, and this does represent an important racial milestone, particularly as far as white racial tolerance is concerned. Um, However, the importance of Poitier's leading role here is not sufficient, in my view, to negate the racial retreat in the film's representational politics. Returning to Howard Wynand, who has written powerfully on post-racial laissez-faireism among whites, he, descri he describes a, a kind of, quote, ideological facelift following the civil rights legislative victories, which seems to well capture Hollywood's brand of retreating liberalism. He says... Even where reforms took place, they generally did not entail major shifts in social policy or personnel. He's talking about the immediate post-civil rights period, post-civil rights act period, the late 60s and early 70s, when the, the kind of real battle was on. As if the mere appearance of racial democracy were, were all that the movement challenges of the post-war period had really required by way of a state reform policy response, Segregation continued to flourish quite nicely in the post-civil rights era. Sure, it had been palliated, and especially where access to rights and privileges on the part of the crucial black bourgeoisie was concerned. In the Heat of the Night crystallizes these dynamics as a powerful film narrative. It's about mere appearance that sucks energy away from actual material struggles for social justice. And in the sole black character of Tibbs, we see a token, the token accessing of rights and privileges by the black bourgeoisie, which, as Wynant states, is cruci a crucial ingredient in such incorporative politics. Without the movie business having yet given up any of its white privilege in behind-the-scenes workplaces, Jewison is able to congratulate himself on a job well done through fictive images on screen. What's more, Jewison and others were gaining great legitimacy and profits from staging racial, racial problem pictures by tapping into the moral economy of the movement. And it's not just the likes of liberals like Norman Jewison that were benefiting from civil rights rhetoric on film, half-faith Hollywood management were able to use Poitier vehicles like in the heat of the night to reject calls for industry integration from minority groups. Um, in a representative statement in the late 60s which refers explicitly to Poitier in an attempt to repudiate the, the federal activism from the Justice Department, Vice President of the motion, American Motion Picture and Television Producers, Charles Boren, states, the best evidence of improvements in the film industry is up there on the screen. The public can see what has been done. The screen speaks for itself, and he, he actually names Poitier as the screen speaking for itself in this context. So In the Heat of the Night present, presented a misleading image of the racial division of labour in America's workplaces and within the industry itself, which lent discursive support to the liberal retreat from racial interventionism within Hollywood and across America. When the battle was just about to get going in Hollywood, these filmmakers presented a North that was already very magnanimously settling its racial questions. With colorblind laissez-faire conservatism having mainly won the day following this moment of crisis, and profound national discussion, it's worth pointing out that Hollywood elites are still overwhelmingly white to this day. So just for, for a conclude, concluding point, um, I want to finish by saying um, how this case introduces the approach taken in my wider project um, on race politics in American film. Um, the final point. My, my project sets out to take a detailed look at production and institutional politics in the industry as well as looking at key film texts. And it's worth saying that the production side, film production studies of race, have been seriously neglected in scholarship. Media scholars um, Dave Hesmondolch and Anamik Saha, in an article just this year, state quite emphatically that the lack of research on race, ethnicity, and cultural production is alarming. 
And I say there's a particular shortfall in work on white racial attitudes and practices in the cultural industries past and present. So I'm interested in production and text. And I'm also interested in exploring the complex relationship between the two, the ways that production contexts feed into textual relations, and in a feedback loop, how key film texts can come to do important PR work for minority groups in some cases and or for the movie industry, as in this case. These intersections between production and text, I argue in my book, following the likes of cultural industry scholars like Christine Gledhill and Dave hesman jolch have been very underdrawn. Work still too often follows the well-worn divide between either political economy on the one hand or cultural studies on the other. It either looks at production studies, which aren't interested in text, nor in social power relations, or it looks at theorised textual readings, which are very interested in discursive power relations, but are not, not really interested at all in material production conditions. Uh, those, those are the general tendencies um, in, the, in the scholarly field of, of race uh, and film. By combine, combining industry and text, we can pose penetrating questions about racial formation in the US film industry. Thank you.